Folks, I uh, made contact with Andrew uh, several years ago when I was looking for information that would allow us to, to connect the domestic uh, load classes with the rest of South Africa. You know, we'd done this, uh, a lot of domestic load research and we'd, um, we'd developed these domestic load classes and then we used the, the descriptions of these load classes as a method of identifying them and, and kind of managing the, the customer groupings that the guys were using for planning. So I, I was trying to relate that to the rest of South Africa and I approached Andrew and his crew who had a data portal where they had sort of a slice of the census information for South Africa. And that, that allowed us to sort of then um, extrapolate the domestic load research classes into an estimate of the load and consumption for the whole of South Africa. And then also we sort of bumped into the LSMs, which is an alternative kind of grouping system and, and incorporated those LSMs into the South African customer load classes. So this association goes back many years and I think 8020s is busy with that development all the time. So Andrew is kind of one of the founders of 8020 and he got a BA in international relations from the University of Toronto, Canada. He completed an MBA uh, in South Africa, which we're very grateful for, Andrew, and continued yeah. MBA studies in the University of Washington. So Andrew manages a research team that uh, develops marketing of a research team and the development of marketing of 8020's data products, including its 8020 data portal and consumer credit data and financial wellness portals, et cetera, et cetera. If you swap details with Andrew, you'll most likely be invited at some stage to a little presentations they do every now and again when they complete an interesting project and it is well worth going to sit in on these projects because they tell you something new about the domestic customers in South Africa every single time. Highly recommended. So make contact with them if you want, if you want to go to those things. Other areas of focus for Andrew, they're using statistical methods to segment the South African customer market, consumer market, and, and they're helping companies understand and use secondary data to create insights and manipulate and present data. So Andrew has also received several scholarships and, and so on for ac academic performance. And I think I'll hand over to Andrew to dazzle us with where AMPS, you know, what AMPS transformed itself into and what we might take away from that in terms of the domestic customers in South Africa. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks, Marcus. Really appreciate that intro. All you need to know, I'm, I'm, my name's Andrew and, and this is my company and we use data in, in all its uh, sources, formats, in order to just bring insights to our clients and help them with their problems. So one of the challenges just with this particular one, just to kind of set the stage, normally the clients either paid for the data or paid for put this together, but in ESCOM hasn't paid yet for the maps data. So I've only been able to, I would have loved to have cobbled together something interesting, specific design for you, but I, I'm not allowed to use the data in that way unless it's paid for. So what I've done is, um, thanks to Citibank, who paid for a presentation uh, last week, I've kind of taken a bunch of their slides, so so you can thank them if you want, but I don't. I think they'll be fine. They, they do well. But it's more like a high-level view of AMPS and MAPS and some slides that will, will give you some insight into what it can do. So just to kind of set the scene, I'm, I, I can't talk about appliance usage, I can't talk talk about electricity access, all that kind of stuff, just so you know. But I, I think it'll still be quite interesting regardless. Just to kind of speak to you about this MAPS data set, there was a data set called AMPS, and it started literally 43 years ago and ran for 40 years. It predates television in this country, and it was used, the AMPS stands for the All Media and product survey and what it gave was a single view of media and product purchase for all south africans it was an independent piece of research so it wasn't paid for by the media owners or any it was paid for by advertising spend and the way the organization lived was a percentage of advertising spend went to them 
which you didn't know about because it wasn't it wasn't a line item on any accounting uh, report. It was just a percent that went off to them. In about 2015, 2016, what happened was with the rise of internet, there became this jostling for power between the TV people who traditionally, I mean, you know, 90% of ad spend went through the TVs back then. And this new group called the internet that we're kind of saying, hey, you know, we're actually getting a lot of ad spend as well. TV then kind of pushed back and said, well, you know, we've only got two seats at the table when, you know, print media has two as well. And we certainly outperform print media. And as, uh, you know, my, my father's an engineer and and what, you know, from, 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 from my experience with him, if you're really good at making a bridge, they make you CEO, which probably, you know, your bridge building skills might not necessarily transfer over to just CEO space. Um, and, and so what you had at this organization, SARF, was great statisticians trying to organize and group and keep together a grumpy group of, of people on a board. And, and they, they failed spectacularly and amps disappeared. What's happened since then is no one's really been able to replicate the research in a very good way. And the body has come back as the Market Research Foundation has taken all the learnings from the AMPS study and and built this new database called MAPS, which is basically AMPS just with new questions, updated, different uh, methodologies, etc. So that's kind of the quick story about what happened with them. So the MRS is a nonprofit controlled by marketers. It's independent of commercial interest. It's neutral and transparent. It's quite important because the other research in South Africa is actually paid for by by media owners, which makes it uh, you know there's a potential that it could be biased in that stage. It's a single source replacement for AMPS. It's cleaned up, modernized, and with consumer-centric focus. And mixed methodologies, they actually fuse data. They have a leave-behind survey, and they have a standalone face-to-face survey. Things like media, sorry, cinema, digital, out-of-home, print, radio, TV can be made, measured from a single source, and it can be measured across platforms. So do you, do you read newspaper on your tablet is, is one of the ways they look at it. Do you listen to the radio, which is, which is becoming the dominant form? Do you listen to the radio on the internet as opposed to in your car? Or on a radio, it has hundreds and hundreds of brands, um, and thousands, so thousands of brands and hundreds of brand categories. It, with, but for you guys, what's really important is that demographics around life stages, generation, where you get your electricity, what kind of toilet you flush, what kind of a house you live in. Obviously, Stat South Africa does some of this as well, but not as frequently as 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 these people do, and sometimes not with the same sample size either. It gives great insights into the activities, attitudes, and lifestyles plus consumer behavior, and it's relevant because it's quarterly, and you get four quarters in a year, and you can see what's happening uh, over those periods. What's been particularly interesting, which is what I'm going to show you today is how COVID has affected and impacted the way people are shopping, uh, the number of people in certain income brackets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How do they do it? They, they only speak to adults 15 plus, males and females, national, all nine provinces, the 20,000 sample, which is nationally representative, which is really important. Um, there's a lot of databases out there that are online where you can kind of interview 1,000 people, 2,000, even sometimes 60,000. And you can get results back, but they're kind of meaningless for any kind of planning at a national level. I mean, uh, I'm sure you guys have done basic stats, if not, you know, math. And you know that that unless you're getting a random sample sampled properly, your data could be utterly meaningless, could be so biased that it's, it's not worth looking at. So, so what they have done is they've gone across to all of the different districts and geographic areas, and they've had to sample based on uh, demographics, a certain number of people of a certain age, marital status, income, race, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, what I'm just getting to is it's, it's, it's a solid piece of research. What's in it? I mean, I kind of touched on this before, but you can see that there's just an astronomical amount of data in there. Just about anything you can think that South Africans do or, 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 or buy or think is going to be in there from sports to, to property ownership, what the property looks like, their employment, you know, what kind of food and drinks they consume, alcohol, where they shop in terms of malls, in terms of like the various categories of clothing, shoes, appliances, decor, and then all of the media and social media. So... I mean, it just it just covers a lot of categories. I mean, I, I'm not trying to sell this to you. I know this is the presentation that I did with them uh, when, when we spoke to Citibank, and these are just their slides that kind of sets the stage for 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 what BAPS is all about. This is to give you an idea. I mean, this is just alcohol. These are the brands and the categories they've got just for alcohol. These are the brands and categories they've got just for clothing and shoe stores, um, and these are the clothes, the, the what they've got for financial products. So you can see there's a, a huge breadth and 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 spread of things. 
When you look at, I mean, often we get asked by our clients to kind of determine, like, is this data useful? Is it irrelevant? You know, should I be trusting what's in here? If I look at what they do, they've got a large sample. So 15,000, well, sorry, it's 20,000 now in September. They've done the sampling properly, as I explained, um, in terms of substitutes and back checks. So they, they back check 25% of the answers to make sure that those are, that the field work was done properly and accurately. And then they only had to substitute about 13%, which means substitution is when you, if you've got a random sample, they give you the 10 houses in this EA that you have to speak to. If you knock on the door of one and that person's not there, you can't just go next door because uh, then it's not it's no longer random. You've got to actually go to the to, to another one, and and they say they've they've substituted about thirteen percent. Um, in terms of the pedigree of research, um, they used to use Nielsen. Now they've used Plus ninety four. One of the reasons was it was it's the only large research house in South Africa that has a BE rating. Uh, the large internationals like Nielsen and Ipsos just uh, they don't even bother with, with BE ratings. It's triangulated with other data. I mean, eighty twenty is responsible for the scrutiny process, so we scrutinize the data. To compare it with other data sets to make sure it's accurate. The one downside is, is it's impossible to measure the impact of COVID on responses in terms of unavailability responses, concern regarding social distancing and the mindset during COVID. You know, we know that, I mean, one thing that's great is people are all generally at home, so that should be easier to find, but do they want to stand there and speak to a stranger for 45 minutes? You know, other thing is we've noticed, I mean, I've certainly noticed with my employees and my family, it's everyone's a little bit more down on the depression scale during COVID than, than general. So, so you know, your worldview and, and, and the state of your mind is going to affect the way you look at um, where you, how you consume things and, and, and how you're going to answer questions. So this is the kind of portrait you can create with, with these data sets. And we do a lot of this, and, and I tend to use these uh, to explain South Africa to a lot of people. If, if we look at, you know, South Africa, it's, it's, it's population of 42.5 million adults, 15 plus. We know that it's uh, close to about 60.1 million total population. What is also very exciting is in October of this year, the census is going to go into field, this first one in 10 years, which is going to produce some really useful results to understand the, what, how much the population has grown. And then all of these will be rebased to that to that number. All, all the surveys that are being done will be rebased to that number. So of these 60 million human beings in South Africa, only, uh, well, about 20 million of them have some form of credit product be it a credit card, a retail store card, a car loan or, or home loan, which is a bit worrying because only 15 million have some form of job. That's formal or informal, uh, full-time or part-time, which which is extremely worrying because recent as recent as 2019, that number was closer to 16.5 million. So either recession followed by COVID has, has wiped out about 1.5 million jobs in this country. Fewer than a third of these, less than 5 million people, pay personal income tax. Um, and the top 2.2% of taxpayers, and I haven't updated the stats, so it might even be worse, but the top 2.2% of taxpayers, which is about 100,000 people, contribute 30% of all personal income tax. So, so you know, it's quite worrying when you've got probably, you know, it's very hard to judge uh, how, how large immigration is in South Africa, but, you know, conservatively, there we can expect about 30,000 people a year to be leaving this country. You know, it, it would take three years to wipe out 30% of our tax base. You know, that, that's, 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 that's a very concerning uh, thing for South Africa. You know, I, I doubt anyone in this room is earning less than uh, 10,000 rand per month by virtue of that enormous salary that you've got, you're in the top 10% of earners in this whole country. We have an incredibly unequal population with the top 13% of households earning more than half of the disposable income. Half our population is younger than 25, but the fastest growing population group is, is 60 plus. So that's, you know, South Africa in a nutshell. And these are the kind of insights that you can get through these, these wonderful secondary uh, uh, data sets. This, this slide often comes to a shock as to, to, to the working South Africans that I deal with, particularly to the investment bankers at Citibank. You can see down here this, this, this bottom part. This is 91% of South Africa is down here under 10,000 rand per month personal income. Now, we know people understate incomes. I mean, that's, that's a given. When we've compared, triangulated, um, you know, some of the survey data out there with some of the national accounts, you know, there, there is, you know, a, a multi-hundred billion rand difference. So we do know that people uh, underclaim. They underclaim at the top, generally because perhaps they're hiding something from the tax man or they're just not wanting to tell somebody at their door the, the salary they have. I know when I went and spoke to the census people in the last census, um, I certainly felt a huge sense of, I mean, the, the closest motion I can say is shame 
when I'm talking to a 18 year old woman making 2.5, 2,500 rand a month, perhaps to tell her what I earn when I'm sitting in my house with my two cars in front, it was, it was a bit of a, yeah, I really don't want to admit to this because it's, it's a bit embarrassing knowing what you earn. at the bottom of the scale. People tend to, you know, the question is asked on an annual basis. And at the bottom of the pyramid, a lot of this work is piecework. So they, gen- they tend to not know the full annual amount. And they might forget that there was a driving job they did or they worked in a Shabin or they helped out a friend in something. And that needs to be um, just thought about when you, when you look at these, these charts. But I mean, if you, think, if you think that maybe these numbers are off by like 25%, which, which is an astronomical number, that still doesn't bring the average annual income to more than 65,000 rand a month. You know, we're, we're sitting at, at, at 4,400 rand average, so average month, monthly salary. I can't see any hands. So if anyone has a question on any slide, just please just, just start talking and interrupt me. I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to do that. If we can maybe hold questions until the end and note the page number, then that might help us to cue these things. Thanks. Okay. So what I've tried to do here is look at a profile of the top two of you know 2016 versus 2021 data. And this, this is probably going back a little bit too far, but one of the things people really want to know is that what was the impact on you know the black middle class, on upper income people, and, and what sort of happened there. If we look at 2016 back here, we can see at the top household income, 40,000 plus, there were about 0.8 million people. There still are. And it's kind of stayed the same, 46% black compared to 51% black. And this is obviously the population group of the head of the household, which is changing in South Africa. I mean, when, it, when I started doing this about 17 years ago, the population of the head of the household was the population group of everyone in the household. That was just a given. We're coming you know, much, much more. We're, we're, we're discovering there are, are mixed race, mixed population group, mixed ethnic group, however, whatever term you want to use, mixed households. And, and that's no longer the case, but but it still is, you know, good 95%. So it, it, it is up there quite high. But what, what we had noticed up until 2016 is this 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 grouping of people who are black moving into the higher income, uh, higher income households, it was growing at, you know, 5% per year. I mean, it was really, really, really astronomical growth, kind of peaked at 2016 and then plateaued, and it's still maintaining, certainly for the wealthy black households, but what's been decimated is this black middle class. The number of people who've, who've dropped from this higher income down to this, you can see there's 5.5 million people earning less than 4,000 rand a month back in 2016. There's now another uh, two and a half million people down in that bottom of the pyramid. And, and a lot of this is, you know, the black middle class got there. If you think about all the additional, let's call them taxes that they pay, you know, they've got, um, they, they weren't, they, they didn't inherit money to start with for the most part. They've got larger households, so there's more expenses. There are certainly a huge number of dependents. There'll be aunts, uncles, grandparents, etc., where you know you, you're either paying for education or you're paying for a bond, or you know. So, so a lot of this ability to be in that middle class lifestyle, which was car, house, um, kids in school, etc., uh, it was it was it was driven off of the the easy access to credit. And and a lot of these people were generally about one paycheck away from just falling back down into this 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 lower class. So we can we can see that not we can see it better on this chart. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't get the order of these right. Let me just go to that right now. So here's what we're looking at. It's a very busy slide. I'm, I'm not really expecting you to to take the entire thing in, but what you can see here is if you look at this top. You know, 2.2 million people at the top. Now it's gone to 20 million, and and if you look at the white population, that's actually dropped. For the black population, it's also dropped, but not at the 50 plus. At the 50 plus, this this group has actually grown. But did you can see that the black population is is only dropped by six percent during COVID, which is which is you know quite good. Colored Indian dropped more by 30 percent, off a much lower base, but 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 much bigger growth. Then this is where the trauma really sits in. You can see how like these are large drops and huge gains down here at the bottom, you know, 112, 216%, 53%. So it just really, in terms of the numbers, you can much more easily see just how this 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 movement has been downwards, you know, quite brutally. And, and obviously what's happening there is reduced salaries, cut working hours, forced unpaid leave, loss of jobs, lack of safety nets or financial products to maintain and support income levels during COVID or unemployment, 
you know, the highest unemployment rate. I mean, what I've heard, I haven't haven't managed to corroborate myself, but apparently of all the countries that do record unemployment rates, we 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 are we are the highest now. Um, and then the big one, defaulting on loans. And we can see on the credit data that 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 certainly through COVID, there were a huge number of people that were not able to keep up with their their the, the credit debt that they they maintained they 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 had. Sorry, I might have to jump around a little bit. So, so what we're looking at here is is we're trying to unpack the difference between the affluent white population and the affluent black population. And when I discussed these slides with a friend of mine who's who's a lecturer at UCT, he said this must be what it was like to have been on the top deck of the Titanic, which 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 I think is a little bit uncharitable about South Africa, but but it, it may be apt. But here you can see that that drop in the affluent white population. Um, you can see the the proportion of males to females has become more skewed towards males. The proportion of singles has risen dramatically, twenty eight percent to forty seven percent. You know, as people are delaying getting married, as people are delaying childbirth. You know, these are all the things that are that are affecting this this white affluent population. If we compare it to the black affluent population, this is also the same credit we put in. You know, you must earn forty thousand rand a month to get into this this income band. It's 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 dropped slightly, as I mentioned, at fifty thousand plus. It, it it's gone up a bit. You know, this group is responsible for two hundred twenty one billion of our of our about getting on about three trillion in, in total spend in South Africa. We've noticed that the average age has stayed uh, pretty much the same, but but we can just see how how these the, the, these groups have changed in, in in as a result of of the pandemic and 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 the the recession that was was with us before we went into that. Sorry, I'm I'm skipping around a little bit because I I thought I put these slides the right way. I mean, Marcus did mention uh, LSM, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone's clear on 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 LSM and what it does. And I've given you one slide that shows how that's changed. LSM is a measure of of things you own. I mean, if you go to our website amu20.co.za, there's a there's a a calculator at the bottom that'll tell you what LSM you're in. So, so what you can you can do is is you can say um, you know it's got questions like do you have a kitchen sink do you have running water do you have a refrigerator do you have a television do you have a car are you living in a metro area each of those gives you a score you add it all up and it puts you into either LSM six or LSM ten depending on how many of these things you you have one of the criticisms of it is is one everyone in the household gets the same LSM so I might be LSM ten. But my 15-year-old daughter, who has no money of her own, is also LSM 10. So is, is that really fair? Another thing is, is when you look at the, the basket of goods that gets you into LSM 10, I mean, you're in here because you've got a home theater, an air conditioner, you know, a vacuum cleaner, and all these sorts of things. And there's been a huge price deflation in a lot of these. So they're saying, was it really fair? That I mean, it's much easier to get into LSM 9 and 10 now than it was, you know, a long time ago. Another thing you could argue is you could say, you know, there's no one in Manhattan other than a few handful of people that are ever going to get above LSM 7 and 8 because no one in Manhattan has, you know, a washer and a dryer in their house and, and most of them don't own a car. And, you know, but you certainly wouldn't consider them LSM seven to eight when you were marketing to them my biggest criticism of it is just this 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 kind of pyramidal structure that it that it pretends we have what this suggests is that there's this kind of large middle class but it really this is just the bucket of things that gets you into lsm6 one of the things we used to do as a company is we would do township tours we would take somebody to a uh, a shack and say okay let's let's guess what lsm this this person is and, um, you know, they'd say LSM one to three, maybe four tops because they had a roof. It was corrugated tin with a, a, an old billboard for, for a roof. Then we would go in and we'd have the calculator and we'd calculate their LSM. And they were somewhere around seven because they had a TV in there. There was a fridge in there. There was a toilet that flushed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my biggest criticism. It's there's been some attempts to upgrade it or replace it, and SEM is the biggest contender right now. While LSM looks at 29 different goods to get you into this category, this one looks at about 14. And these are more around what is your house built with? How far are you from a police station? How many rooms are there in your house? Which I do think are better metrics. And as you can see, you have a slightly more of a pyramidic structure. So, you know, it, it does better represent South Africa, although if it did, this should be a really, really fat bottom and, and a very narrow top but but it is it is coming on to to kind of like challenge lsm what i'm finding is the people that came up with it they, they charge people to use it so as a result nobody has i, I don't know any companies that, that rely exclusively on sem and those that do will say you know our target market is sem seven to eight but that's lsm five to seven
so so it's it's kind of like you know the Canadians do metric, you know, like they they measure themselves in feet, but if they they do know what they what they uh, their height in in centimeters as well. You can also see that they're very very strongly correlated once you get past LSM six or seven. I mean, this is LSM seven, SEM seven, SEM eight, LSM eight perfectly correlated LSM SM9 and then slightly different here. So, you know, for the for the segments that are really the ones that the retailers want to speak to, there there's not much of a difference um, between the two measures in terms of the how they correspond with each other. What you need to understand also though, if you're looking at LSM as, as a measure two, is you know, like here's where all your people are in South Africa, but here's where all your money is. And what I wanted to show you, this was one to kind of give you an idea of like the relative average household incomes between the different LSMs. So you can see LSM 10 is, you know, getting on twice as uh, high of an income as LSM 9. But we just updated this for you actually like an hour ago. What this gives you is is what percentage were in each LSM band from 2013 to 2021. Now, what's interesting here is, is you can see there is no difference between 2019 and 2021. Few more people going into LSM nine. A few more people going to LSM eight. No difference. No difference. And then this drop in these lower LSMs, which which should not be interpreted as things getting better for South Africa. It really should just be looked at as it's it's easier to get into these higher income these these higher sorry sorry not income easier to get into these higher LSM categories, but. Like I was often say, LSMs are like cockroaches. So you're never going to get rid of them. People they're just too embedded into the into the the structure of South Africa and and the the way marketers speak and the way everyone speaks. So we continue to show our our information based on LSMs. What we've done here, and this is not maps data at all. I'm just it's a slide. Uh, I was putting in a, a couple of slides that I thought might be interesting for you to look at. This just shows the difference in expenditure based on your LSM. So down here, we've got the 4 million households in LSM 1 to 4. You can see that almost a third of their income goes to food. Whereas up here at LSM 10, there's also 4 million people, um, 8 to 10, only 10% goes to food and not alcohol beverages. Why? Well, I mean, you can only spend so much on food. And as your income goes up, your, your relative spend on, on, on food, it stays the same, but as a percentage drops, on the other side, you know, there's no limit to how much um, some men can spend on cars, and you can see that it shows it uh, as well. Um, what is interesting down here, though, is clothing and footwear. There's obviously limits on what people can spend on clothing and footwear. So, so what we we've done a, and Marcus may have been at this one. We did an entire presentation just trying to explain this clothing and footwear thing. Obviously, it's a percentage of income, so you'd expect it to be bigger. But I mean, it's a dramatic difference. And we found that there 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 had to be a lot more sort of signaling down at this level. You know, like like I myself. Uh, would walk into a bar with some torn jeans and an old shirt and still expect to get served. Somebody who comes from a lower income might definitely want to signal that they've arrived with with clothing that is new and 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 more expensive and more branded, etc. What's also happening down here at the very bottom is 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 for for a lot of these people, the house was was given to them by the government. They're not paying for education. They're not paying for health. Not to say that it's good, but they're not paying for it. So it does open up, uh, you know. The ability to spend more on on other areas and then obviously down here there's a car there but it's it's transportation so this is really uh, mini buses buses taxis and trains up here it's 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 vehicles purchase of vehicles and then the operation expenses in terms of petrol and and repairs and getting new batteries etc um, what I then wanted to do, I mean, I've, I've kind of like, like those are those are the kind of, um, you know what I'd like to do? I'd actually like to open up to questions now because, I mean, this is really, the, these are the map slides that I've been able to kind of share and, and just get get some, some, some take some questions and, and, and see if I can have some conversation around these slides before I move to the next bit, which is a bit, a bit more, a bit less on topic. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm looking at the questions which are being queued in the in the chat column. I'll go to Tsolani. Yes. Tsolani, do you want to give voice to your question? So, hi, Andrew. Looking at, you shared a slide showing the sample and as well as the percentage distribution saying 50% of that sample would be from your metros and I think something like 20% from rural and 30% from uh, my question there is with Houting having what three metros, will that then not translate to Houting being or the view being tipped more towards what's happening in Houting mm, more than mm. any other place? Yeah. V very definitely. And 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 because they wanted to. 
is the, the two answers. So, so I mean, one of the challenges with with doing this kind of work is because you know, let me just get to it. Because of this slide, you have to. You know, so if you think if you did a, a random sample distributed across all of South Africa, you'd have 91% of your sample sitting down here in the below 10,000 rand. OK, now the challenge is this. These two groups barely make they barely spend as much money as these two groups. You know, like that, that's the disparity in South Africa. So when you've got a, a database that's being used by marketers, retailers, financial services, etc., you know, you, you don't want 91% of your sample to be down here. You want it to be a little bit more overweighted up here. Now, in South Africa, there's a number of ways you can do this. I mean, if you want to do it really easily and quite brutally, you could just, you know, sample more white people. I mean, it's 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 still an extraordinarily unfair, uneven, unequal country, and it's still geared mm -hmm. towards most of the wealth sitting with older white people. So that's one thing you could do, but obviously that's not going to fly in in, in any, any post-apartheid world. So what they've tried to do, I mean, it's one of the reasons they came up with LSM was to kind of stop using terms like um, the rising black middle class or black diamonds. Just say, well, let's just say they're LSM and mm -hmm. pretend that we're all the same and, and you know, mm -hmm. and everyone will be happy ever after. But but what they've done now, which I think is a, is a fairly good way, is they've said, well, let's just overweight the metros. And in that reason, you know, in that way, I mean, if you think about this group down here, probably half of them are in like deep rural areas. And they're not consuming cars. They're not. They're not buying uh, fresh milk. You know, they're, they're, there's things that they're not. They're not buying. So if you just just by virtue of overweighting the metros, you get a, a sample that represents the the economic view of South Africa, but doesn't distort it too too badly. That, that, so yeah. Mm. So so yes. Kauteng is overrepresented in the sample deliberately. If you want, um, and, and what's really interesting about this is it, it was a bit of a debate until the establishment survey came out in 2017 or so, and they did completely nationally representative sampling, and no one can use that database. Because as soon as you say, I want people who, who are listening to 5FM and drive an Audi, you've got two people. When you overweight these metros, you can do those filters and more and still have a sample of 120 that you can you can do something with. OK, maybe just a follow up that is there some sort of a weighting in so far as population of the different provinces is concerned, say, OK, there's so much people in Gauteng, so a percentage of that sample should come from Gauteng and based on how many people are in the Western Cape, a percentage of that sample should come from the Western Cape. Yeah, yeah. So they, they do the sampling based on, and I don't have it on the spot, I don't have it at my fingertips, but yeah, it, it, it's it's age, race, marital status, gender, province, and a couple other variables, yeah. Okay. It, well, yeah, and, and and I mean, what what what, what it does is, is, I mean, I don't know if I can explain it in like a short period of time in a way that's going to make it, but, you know, what, what, all that happens is I represent a larger number of people. It, and, and so, so yeah, they're, they're, you know, I'm probably not going to explain this in a way that's not going to make it sound completely badly the way it's done. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, they, 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 they've just overweighted the areas that have more, more income and more, more revenue, but that doesn't give you an incorrect population number. The population number is still mm. the same. It's still set to the census, um, what the census found. Yeah. No, no, I think I get what you mean. So th it's like if you have five industrial customers, they will consume a lot more energy than five residential customers. And if you have to weight them, you'll, you'll have an equivalent of sort of more customers that are industrial. If you are saying that they were to be residential customers, so have a more number there than the actual number. But at the end of the day, you have yeah, okay. Yeah, and just to clarify, this is domestic households. Continue, Andrew. Yeah, no, that's it. Um, I'm happy to, to look at another question. Okay, um, I have one. Uh, I assume SEM, the acronym stands for Socioeconomic Measure. Is that correct? It does, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Andrew, can you maybe comment on what electricity-related uh, related questions are gathered uh, during your survey? Like, 
is it lights and etc et uh, what, what so is one is do you have electricity at all um so that's one the second is what's the source of the electricity but you know it's it, the 98 is mains there there's a, an area for generator to kind of look in there um they've had to change that because when they started that question people had generator always had generator but now loads of people have generators and they just use it periodically they are going to put a question into the survey going next um have you have you gone without power for uh, a period of time in the last two days? Because what they're finding is the, I mean, it's like a really fascinating thing of the impact of load shedding. You know, media charge you to deliver eyeballs. Now, if they don't deliver those eyeballs because the power was out, like who who's responsible for that? You know, like can can the media owner still charge when they're on a platform that's reliant on 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 electricity? That that you know, like the, obviously the magazines and the and 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 other media don't don't suffer from so what they're going to do is add a question to kind of just understand how many people might have been impacted by a lack of power during the the period that they're looking at then on top of that there are electric devices so i mean i've done a number of things i don't know if you guys are familiar with paul harris i'm sure he worked with some of you at some stage along the way but yeah, so he's done work with our data just to kind of estimate loads. So we, with him, we're really looking at like the number of people who have a kettle, a number of people who have a vacuum cleaner, et cetera, et cetera, and then just try to try to build up a model from from you know from the bottom up as opposed from the top up. Yeah, so those are the main questions: what kind of electricity? What sorry? What's the source of electricity? Do you have electricity? And what appliances and power drawing things do do you have in your house? Okay, so currently you don't ask, is there any tension to pick up information about consumption specifically or the presence or absence of photovoltaic um, supplies as opposed to a generator? Yeah, I mean, I imagine there might be. The, the challenge when you get to that is, is you know, even generator is so tiny it's almost not worth asking, you know, because it's, you know, you'll get a number, but it's based on a sample of, let's say, 50 people, and there's not much you can do with it. You can't do that by age or income or any other measure because, you know, we kind of set a base limit. Like, if, if you don't have 40 answers for a question, we don't even look at it. But even with 50, you split that by age, each age category is going to be like seven people, which which is meaningless, you know. So it might come in, but it is a very low number, uh, just to judge by generators. Because I imagine, you know, those are, what, a tenth of what generators are, maybe, or, or even less. Yeah, these these things also tend to be a niche, uh, you know, it's, it's a wealth-related thing. The, mm. the, uh, the wealthier you are, the more you will uh, assure your, your continuity of supply. I see Vasu, Vasu Chetty from Durban has his hand up. Vasu, do you have a question for us? Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, thanks, Andrew. I just want to check. What is the source of your information? That's the first one. And then do you go right down to province and suburb level? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, that's where I was going to go to next, where, I mean, this is our data portal, which, which ESCOM has had access to in the past. And basically, we take all of these data sets and we go through them and and we we know you know so so i mean the next thing i want to tell you about was just triangulation just to kind of show you something i think you might be interested in you know in the past if i wanted to understand the the occupations of people that shop in malls and how to reach them with media i would go to the labor force to get their occupations i would go to roots to get their mall behavior and i'd have to go to amps or now maps to to kind of get their 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 media behavior so so we we draw from a variety of different data sources everything i've shown you up until now has been from the maps data set and it's their survey so they interview these 20,000 people and then they charge us to access that data this particular data set goes down to small place but i can tell you there's there's only useful data on about a thousand of the small places. In fact, probably not even a thousand, probably 500 of the small places, just because once again, they, they didn't get a sample of more than 30 people in some of these really small, small places. The small places can be, you know, a suburb will be made up of, of say four small places or sub places. Yeah, so so the data, each data set has a different granularity. Obviously like the census, you can go down to EA area. Maps, you can go down to that small place area. Amps, you can only get down to suburb and only like six suburbs in Johannesburg, so it's six suburb areas. Roots has a variety of different suburbs, but it's non-national representative sample. So it really depends on the survey. If you look at the larger Stats South Africa ones, they go down to a uh, municipality or, or, or district council. Yeah, thanks for that. So basically what we see in a is that 
since COVID, our collection rates, you know, for utilities and rates has, has really gone down, right? Yeah. Yeah. And obviously now we're going into a period where we, we're trying to get more renewables into our network, which is obviously going to push the price of electricity up, you know? Yeah. So it's really a question of, you know, um, how much can we actually charge, you know, and yeah. across the various LSMs? Obviously, certain people would afford it, but, you know, yeah. from the data that you're providing, Obviously, a large number of them would not be able to afford, you know, a higher price of electricity than we are already charging. You know? Yeah, look, I don't claim to be an expert on pricing. I'm very bad at it with my own business. Um, but but it's 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 a challenging, thorny question. When you say collections, do you mean consumption's gone down and therefore your collections are down, or the ability to get the money from the people has gone down? Like like which which of those? So, so it's actually both. The consumption has gone yeah. down slightly. But it's yeah. actually the collections uh, to get the money, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's challenge. I mean, it's what I find. I find amazing about South Africa, and then sorry, I mean, I did grow up overseas in 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 a very law-abiding place called Canada, and and one thing that struck me so hard with with South Africa is this this general disregard for the law. And and it's not like people are killing each other. It's just like nobody really stops when the lights kind of yellowish going red, you know. And 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 there's there's always a way around. Like if if you can get your driving license a little bit easier, like, you know, you'll find those ways. And and it's it's not a disrespectful thing. It's just like a noticing that there there's this kind of, you know, Canada. You you you, you cross the road properly whether people are looking or not, you know. Whereas here you just, just walk. And what I find fascinating is this whole. And I wish I could understand it or unpack it better for my clients is like what you choose to pay for. And we've noticed this very much in the in the credit space where, you know, it's not that you can't pay your retail loan off. You just know they're not going to come back and take that sweater. So why pay it? You know, like and and I wonder like how much of that comes through in what you guys try to do with collection of 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 rates, rates, taxes, electricity, whatever it is. You know, like like there are people that will just not pay it even though they can and then the, at the top end there's people that won't pay taxes once again even though they can they'll find a way to kind of like like hide that income or or or, or not pay those taxes so yeah you know it it, it, it it's a really challenging problem um and I, I don't know how you you get people to kind of understand the value of having power to the point where they're they're always willing to pay for it yeah, I don't know if that was terribly helpful, but it's like an observation that I've made about this country having lived here 20, 23 years now. Andrew, what we have seen through, we've had a number of discussions with COVID and so on, and what we have seen is that the almost university, I, I'm thinking about our guys in Cape Town, Cedo is here, who can talk to that, and Vasu as well, and the ESCOM uh, transmission forecasting guys, they, they all seem to be saying that, you know, we're seeing... A consumption coming down and mm-hmm. it's universi- universally, you know, year on year, it's something like 5% or more in magnitude that it's that it's reduced uh, over the previous year. So that's significant when you think about uh, sort of that it should be linked to GDP and GDP's sort of holding its own. We yeah. see consumption coming down uh, notwithstanding. So, um, and and that that's filtering in all the new like um, I mean every appliance I buy has that A B C D E rating on it you know all my light bulbs are now going to that faster consuming. I also think there's a way you know I don't hear that joke about like um, sort of dead man walking, dad man walking. You know, it's basically your dad just walking through, switching off lights and moaning about how you keep leave the lights on all the time. Like you you can control it. It's one of the few things you can actually control. Like turn off the damn light and it'll save you a few pennies. You know like. I don't know, I, you know, but I certain, yeah, I mean, obviously this is your business. You must look at those things, but I just wonder how much that impacts that people now can get much, much more efficient utilities. Well, we, Sorry, are, appliances. Yeah, we are seeing a more efficient, energy efficient appliances arriving, but, you know, it's all related to COVID and we've mm. seen the, the loads which they were monitoring, which are mostly domestic. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've all seen this a substantial drop. And and it's COVID was a stimulus, you know, for people yeah. to perhaps investigate or whatever. But the bottom line is that there's less there's less electricity for, to charge for now. Yeah. So yeah. Even if um, this is measured energy, it, it wasn't a revenue based thing. So yeah. It's just, yeah. 
Yeah. There's less electricity to charge for. Other yeah. thing in South Africa is that, you know, you've got this very flat pyramid where your wealthy are a smidgen on top of this big hump of, of poor people. Yeah. And yeah. if you think about cross-subsidizing, it looks like that, that pyramid is getting flat and flat and we are running out of places to cross-subsidize from, possibly. Yeah. I'm hoping yeah. we have an economic recovery. Solani has asked a question how is income considered for LSM? No, not at all. Doesn't factor in in the slightest. Okay, but income um, can be used to describe it. Yeah, so what we just do is we take everyone in LSM 10 and then give their average income. So so you can you can say, you know, that the, the average income of this cohort is X, but they didn't get into that LSM because they had that income. And sorry, I've got another slide I can I can maybe send you, but like it, it's much better viewed on a whisker plot where you can kind of see 50% of all LSM 10 are within, let's say, 25 and 65,000 rand a month. But the whisker plot extends down to zero and up to you know three hundred, four hundred thousand rand a month. So yeah, it's it's that's that's probably the better way to to describe income by looking at LSM. Yeah, and mm -hmm. Solani, just in addition to that, in the definition of the South African low classes, I sort of bracketed the LSM range. Uh, it was like two thirds of of the the LSMs say LSM 10 was between this and that uh, income mm. range. That's how uh, that was defined. Okay, gents from the audience, any any other comments or questions at this stage or should we let Andrew carry on? Okay, Andrew, um, please continue. Yeah. So I, I didn't want to spend too much time on this because it's a bit more like shameless self-promotion, but I, I, there is a reason why I want to show it to you because I do think it is a really interesting tool. What we've done is, you know, I explained what we used to go through to kind of understand, say, media spend in, in all these different, yeah, to understand different things, you have to go to different data sets. We've always thought, like, what if you, like, sewed a thread through all these data sets so that you could find the person here's LSM and attach it to census data, which doesn't have LSM, or the credit data, which doesn't have LSM. And and one of the things, you know, one of those um, benefits of COVID is we we lost a pretty huge client, which freed up some of our data scientists to actually work on this problem for the first time in our lives. So we've thought about it for 10 years and we finally managed to crack it. And what we did is we we fused a bunch of data sets together, but but most importantly, we fused it to the credit bureau data. And the, and the key there is the credit bureau data, it's, it's 20 to 25 million people in South Africa, okay? So, you know, you've got representation across the entire country and you can compare completely forget about the sampling problem because now you've got, you know, all these people, which allows you to, to link these thousands of variables in the maps and other data sets to an individual. So I can go to, uh, let's say, Trueworths, and they can give me um, Marcus's ID number. And what I can do is I can take that ID number and I never see the ID number. It goes to the credit bureau and they just tell me Marcus's demographics. And from those demographics, I group him with everyone else in South Africa that has his exact demographics, which, which interestingly is never more than like 100 or 200 people, okay? Because we're doing this on exact age, we're doing it on uh, gender, marital status, income, location, et cetera. So Marcus gets put in this group right here and then that group gets rolled up to these sub-segments, which gets rolled up to this segment. So at like the one thing I can do is I can say, okay, well, Marcus sits in this heavy hitter category. And that's like, you know, that's a very high level view. But what I can then do is I can say, okay, but if I'm a company and let's say that company's ESCOM, I know that there's an individual here. I know the demographics. What I can then do is not only can I tell that Marcus is a heavy hitter, I can tell you how many televisions he's got. I can tell you if he has a kettle. I can tell you how many vehicles he's got and if any of them are electric. I can, you know, I can, I can actually now give all that data attached to, and it's not attached to an individual on a popular level. Like I'm not, I'm not attaching Marcus's ID number to Marcus's responses on this survey. So it's all popular compliant. I'm attaching Marcus's demographics to the demographics of people who have filled out this survey and join those two pieces. So what you can then do, and I mean, this is, I'm not gonna get into this because I don't really have time and it's a bit more detailed, but what you can then do is, is say, okay, what we can also do is we can find all the people in a certain enumeration area, roll them up to Rondebosch and then give a view of Rondebosch. 
And we can say, well, given what we know about this, we can say how many more televisions are sitting in Rhonda Bosch than, say, Mowbray or, 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 or Cavendish. And we can create these views that, that help people understand not only personas, so, so here's or Marcus or Marcus's wife, and, and generally what Marcus's wife looks like is this is where she shops, this is her loyalty cards, this is her credit behavior, this is the kind of media she consumes, these are her demographics. We can speak to, to, to Marcus and Pamela's neighborhood. It's Pinelands, this is what the people look like, this is how many people there are, this is their total spend, this is where they shop, and this is the media they consume. But equally, we could do, I mean, I just don't have a client yet that's interested in it, but we could do a listing of all the appliances that they own and how often they 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 replace them so so that's just what i wanted to end with i think we've got like like four or five minutes but what's fascinating is is when we've done this and and so i mean i was quite I, i'm sure you all remember tabo mbeki's speech where he spoke about like south africa is a land of two nations and and what was fascinating back then is he was, back then he was talking about there's still a long way to go you know, and, and, and there's still this vastly wealthy white population, a vastly poor black population. What's even more fascinating when we did this at a neighborhood level, you know, the obvious comparison is Pinelands and Lunga. And you'll find with Pinelands and Lunga, when you compare them, you know, Pinelands 42% married compared to 20% married, average income 22,000 versus 3,000, you know, average age 48 years, average age 36. 9% unemployment versus 31, 59% of a credit card versus 18, nearly 30% of a mortgage compared to four. So that's like your obvious Becky two nations. But look at this. This is Mitchell's plane in Kailicha. And, and, and two much more relatively balanced or similar areas, you know, 42% marital rate in Mitchell's plane versus 24 in Kailicha. Um, average age 39 versus 35 much lower unemployment rates, retail count, same, and mortgage, probably more to do with the banks than them, but but double in, in Mitchell's plane. And this just got, I mean, I, I find this stuff fascinating. We then also looked at like what their Gini coefficient is, their wealth inequality, and their affluence percentile going from like your wealthiest neighborhood in this group in Pinelands down to your poorest in, in Kailicha. And what we found here that was really interesting is the wealth inequality in Mitchell's plane you know, basically what it's saying is everyone in Mitchell's Plain is kind of similar, um, whereas in Athlone, you've got some very wealthy people and some very poor people in the same neighborhoods. And then this, I mean, this excites me when you can kind of like look at an area in with such detail and, and such granularity. Like, you, you know, what you basically got is a census with the benefits of the thousands of questions in these secondary data sets. And, and I mean, you guys, you know your stats, you know your numbers, and, and you, you, um, those of you who have been following will realize it's just at a probability level. But what's astounding is how accurate those probabilities are. And we've gone, I mean, the one thing I did show is a little test where we kind of did some prediction, and we used the model to, set, to try to predict um, Facebook users. And what we found here is like, if you look at this, that you know, you should have this straight line here of like expected versus observed Facebook users. We had these kind of outliers, but they all tended to be relatively small. So we had to adjust our model to, to, to get it a little bit more accurate. And, you know, that's what we ended up with where, you know, you can see they're all kind of bouncing around the line of, of adjusted versus expected as, as, as you'd want. Um, observed versus adjusted, sorry. So, I mean, that's what I wanted to end in, just because I, I think it's a really, really interesting tool to kind of start looking at, at, at neighborhoods with. But, um, yeah, Marcus, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll just stop there and 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 open up for questions. Um, I do have to run uh, at, a, at about four, but, yeah, I'm more than happy to, to address any questions that might still be there. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. This is a, a very good insight. I think the potential of this data set that you're talking about uh, in the final segment is is quite big for for load forecasting and estimation and so on but uh, you know the uh, planning is is a tricky business yeah. colleagues any any final questions for andrew from the floor just from my side personally i'm continually worried about how we seeing the income permit for south africa just slumping downwards yeah. it, looks, it looks like We've lost substantial ground. Um, we kind of going backwards, and uh, I'm very concerned for the future about how we will get prosperity in this situation in future. That's just my personal concern. It's uh, 
I, I don't know how we're going to escape from this. Okay, any any final thoughts from the audience? Andrew, thank you from my side. This has been a very interesting exercise. I, I love the knitting together of data in your form. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks for giving me an opportunity to show us. I mean, I, I just love... I just love talking about this country and 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 what I love is it's it's a data driven conversation as opposed to well, you know, my cleaning lady tells me this and I, I saw that on the news. It's it's like a well this is what the data says. Um it it certainly is and I'm I really hope that you are um, getting to parliament uh, and speaking to the guys that are in charge of resources in South Africa. This is yeah. very important. Yeah. Thanks. As I said, I find that fascinating and it is always interesting to know more about the domestic customer because it certainly does impact their, uh, you know, what they what they do with their money and how that comes out as consumption. I was very interested to see that your, your spending on, uh, on communication is almost invariant amongst the different customer wealth bands. Uh, to me, that was just something interesting. I, I can't think why that is, but it's something to note. Yeah. Andrew, yeah, again, once again, from my side and from on behalf of the Lotus Search chapter, chapter members, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, been quite a life. Great. Cheers, everyone. Uh...